Good evening. My name is Rebecca Davis. I'm a journalist for the Daily Maverick. A big welcome to all of you on what is in Cape Town anyway, a very wintry night. It's my honor to be here tonight with journalist and writer Pete Patrick Radden Keefe, who's been called one of the most talented nonfiction writers of his generation. Patrick is the author of three books prior to the one we're here to discuss, all of which have been critically acclaimed, dealing with Northern Ireland, Chinatown, and global surveillance. He's also a staff writer for The New Yorker. Patrick, great pleasure to have you with us, and thank you for coming to visit us on the other side of the world. It's great to be with you. Thank you. The book we're discussing tonight is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. Patrick, if you have a copy of it, if you wouldn't mind just showing our audience. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I have been recommending it to everyone I know. It is a magnificent achievement, an incredible sweeping account of the family who made a vast fortune from the drugs Valium and OxyContin, the latter, of course, responsible pretty much directly, as we're going to discuss for America's opioid crisis of recent years. And though that claim might seem overblown, as Patrick books, Patrick's book shows, it very much is not. And I wanted to preface this for our South African viewers by saying that if you think the abuse of opioids is a purely American phenomenon, you are quite wrong. I spoke to a doctor who tells me that our South African version of OxyContin is retailed as OxyNorm. It's a Schedule 6 drug, which means that you can't get it without a doctor's prescription. But it is, he says, very probably wildly overprescribed here, too. And we also know that South Africa is one of the top countries in the world when it comes to volumes of ADHD prescription. So among the middle classes in South Africa, certainly we are well on our way to being thoroughly overmedicated. Although the irony is, of course, that many poor people can't get their hands on the drugs they need. Back to the book. The paradox of the Sackler family, as Patrick is going to explain, is that they have effectively been hiding in plain sight for three generations. On the one hand, extremely showy philanthropists. On the other hand, virtually unknown when it came to their connection with the drug OxyContin. So Patrick, can I ask you to start by explaining how the Sacklers first came to your attention as the potential subject for a book? Sure, of course. I, you know, I came to this subject indirectly. I had written for the New Yorker uh, about the illegal drug trade. I was very interested in drug cartels in Mexico and the ways in which they operated, not just as criminal organizations, but as multinational commodities businesses. And one thing that I noticed was that they were always very careful. You know, I interviewed people who worked in the Sinaloa drug cartel, this big drug cartel, really one of the biggest drug cartels in the world, in Mexico, and, and, and talked to them about the business decisions they made. And one of them was, you know, they were quite diversified. They had different product lines. And what do you decide to send where? Um, and they were very sensitive to customer demand, it turned out. And so at a certain point, this Mexican drug cartel starts sending much more heroin, Mexican heroin, across the border into the United States. And this was a bit of a mystery. Um, why would you suddenly see this big uptick with this one product? And the answer turned out to be that you had a huge community of people in the US who were using heroin now, who hadn't started out using heroin. They had an on-ramp and their on-ramp was prescription pills, prescription painkillers, um, all, you know, which are opioids, which means they're derived from the opium poppy, like heroin. So they're chemical cousins of heroin, but prescribed by a doctor. And so that was kind of the riddle at the outset for me. And as I looked into that, I discovered, you know, really the dimensions of the opioid crisis, which was a staggering public health crisis, which you know, has killed hundreds of thousands of people and addicted millions. Um, and looking into that, I discovered that there was this one company, Purdue Pharma, which had been, in the words of one former employee, it was sort of the tip of the spear. Uh, you know, not the only company that produced these types of drugs, um, but the one that in ways that we can talk about, they made certain decisions which really changed the game and helped give rise to this epidemic. And then I learned that the company was a privately held company owned by this family, the Sackler family. And this was what really uh, caught me by surprise and and in, engaged my interest because I live in New York. And if you've ever been to New York City, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the great art museums in the world has the Sackler Wing. Mm. 
this incredible, beautiful uh, kind of glassed in wing where there's an ancient Egyptian temple that's been transplanted into this wing of the museum. And that's the Sackler wing. And I grew up in Boston and at Harvard University, you have the Sackler Museum. And so I was aware of this name chiefly in its philanthropic context. I, I thought of the Sacklers as this very wealthy dynasty who had given lots of money to the arts and the sciences. And for all I knew, they made their money in the 19th century. It was kind of a, it was a name like Rockefeller or mm -hmm. Car Carnegie. Um, but it turned out that most of this fortune was actually made in recent decades. And there was this paradox, which you identify, which is that they, the family has this kind of mania for putting their name on, on philanthropic gifts. Uh, on buildings, on wings of art museums and university buildings. Um, but then the flip side of that is that they've been very, very uh, careful about erasing the family name when it comes to the opioids that they've sold or the devastating legacy of those opioids. And so they really distanced themselves from that. And so to me, that was the paradox that started this, this project, the idea that you have the name everywhere in one context and nowhere in the other. Mm -hmm. At Oxford, when I was a student there, there was a, a Sackler library, and certainly I walked past it a million times without ever wondering who the Sacklers were, but that's how far their tentacles extended, and not just the UK, not just the USA, but also Israel, medical departments of universities, and as you say, art museums, all sorts of things plastered with the Sackler name. Before we go any further, I should remind everyone that you can order Empire of Pain just by clicking on the, I think it's the live bar in the chat, and you can get free delivery anywhere in South Africa, which is wonderful in these days when we're not supposed to be leaving home. So please do that. Just to repeat, it is a magnificent achievement, this book. It really is. It is 560 pages, and it felt like nothing like that because somehow Patrick has managed to turn legal pages and pages of depositions and archival research into a, the most compelling page turner. So the book is divided into three parts. Part one is about the first generation Sacklers, Arthur Sackler in particular. Part two about the introduction of OxyContin under the second generation. And part three is effectively where it all falls apart. Can we talk a bit about Arthur Sackler, who is just such an incredible figure? I mean, he made me feel exhausted and chronically underachieving. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, yeah, I mean, one of the big decisions in the book was, you know, to not write a book about the opioid crisis per se, but to, to, to really tell this as a family saga about this, this one family, three generations of the family. And, um, I was really interested in Arthur. He was just this kind of larger than life figure. And so I decided to devote the first third of the book really to him, um, though he dies in 1987. He dies before OxyContin is even introduced. So so that was a big choice. Um, but I think a justified one, and I'll tell you why. So um, originally, there are three Sackler brothers, Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond. And their parents are Jewish immigrants who uh, leave Europe at the turn of the last century and end up in Brooklyn, New York. And the brothers grow up uh, against the backdrop of the Great Depression. And their parents have told them they want them to be doctors. All three brothers would end up becoming doctors. Arthur once said, I, I think not in jest, that by the age of four, he knew he would be a doctor because that was what his mother wanted. Um, and Arthur, as the oldest brother, sort of had to step in, particularly during the depression when the family lost everything they had and he was just working all kinds of jobs left and right. And he just had this protean energy and this charisma and he kind of wanted to do it all. And so his story in those early years is, is in some ways a very archetypal American immigrant story about um, a young striver looking to make a dent in the world, looking to really leave his mark. And initially it looked as though he would do that through medicine um, he became a psychiatrist. He went and, and worked with patients suffering from mental illness, but he was a big believer in pharmaceuticals. And this was a very exciting period in pharmaceutical history. So, you know, penicillin had been introduced. Uh, this is following the second world war. You suddenly have really the birth of big pharma as we know it today, all of these companies cropping up and developing these new drugs, antibiotics chiefly at first. Um, and there are new products coming out every week. And there was a real sense of optimism and idealism, a sense that someday there'd be a pill for every human mm. aff affliction. And Arthur saw in this a, 
a kind of wonderful world of, of therapeutic possibilities, but also of business opportunities. And he goes into business uh, initially not as a of running a pharmaceutical company himself, but doing medical advertising. He's the person who will help these companies advertise their drugs. And one of his great um, innovations was that he realized that you know, it's not just the consumer that you're trying to reach. The person you really want to reach is the doctor. If you can influence the doctor who writes the prescriptions, that's the way you create a blockbuster drug. And so Arthur became tremendously successful. You know, as you said, he, he, he designed the, the marketing uh, scheme for Valium, and made, which at the time was the, the most successful drug in the history of the pharmaceutical business made an, an enormous fortune doing that and started getting into philanthropy and art collecting and had a lot of drama with various wives. But he was, for, for all of the color around Arthur, the reason that I wanted to focus on him is that I think that he had a genius for breaking down the boundaries between medicine and commerce, for, for allowing commerce to manipulate and drive medicine and for all of the conflicts of interest that come along with that. And so I think that even though he dies in 1987, you can see in embryo in the story of Arthur Sackler, all of the phenomena that will later play out uh, in the opioid crisis. And indeed in his family's um, marketing and sale of OxyContin, this, this very, very powerful drug. Indeed, and so in the, in the late 50s, well, in 1952, he, he buys the small pharmaceutical company called Purdue Frederick for his brothers. Late 50s, the race is on to develop a tranquilizer, and we see the introduction of Valium and Librium. And here we see, I think, the roots, as you say, of what was later to come. When it comes out that Librium might be addictive, the attitude straight away is it's not the drugs that are the problem. The issue is the patients taking it who are predisposed to addiction. This is very telling, isn't it, in terms of what would happen? I think that's right. Yeah. So you get this, you, you get, um, again, in Arthur's story, there, there is a little preview of, of mm -hmm. everything that comes later. And so, um, initially the, the minor so-called minor tranquilizers are these new wonder drugs developed in the 1950s and early sixties. And the idea is, um, they'd had major tranquilizers before, which were for psychotic patients. But the idea was everybody can use a little, you know, a little chill pill, um, mm. something to calm them down a bit. And so this is how Librium and Valium were positioned for stress, for psychic tension, for neuroses. Um, and, and for, as you say, for the condition of being female. Yes, they were very, very heavily and cynically marketed toward uh, women. And, and there were all these advertising campaigns put out by Arthur's company which would, it was, it was like it hit, you know, it was the sort of, um, if you had a, you know, a, a young woman who goes off to college, there was this idea that, oh, it's so stressful being at college. How is she to handle it? What she really needs is Librium. If she ends up uh, having a career, it's the kind of stress of the career woman. You know, the office must be so overwhelming. Uh, help take the edge off. There was really a, a um, you know, a, any, any sort of affliction, all of them coded often with, with this sort of gender, um, you know, uh, sense of gender and, and, and you know, the frailty of women. Um, uh, this was a big part of the sale. So these drugs become hugely successful, but they're also extremely habit forming and in many cases quite addictive. And it takes, it takes people a while to wake up to this, but Arthur's attitude, and this was fairly prevalent in the pharmaceutical industry at the time was, oh, well, it's not the drugs that are the problem. It's these people. You have some people who have addicted per addictive personalities and they abuse the drugs. But, you know, if they weren't abusing my tranquilizers, they'd be abusing some other drug. This is more about their personal proclivities. And, you know, it's funny. I don't, I don't know enough about the culture in South Africa to know if there's a similar strain in South African culture, I think of there being a very pronounced strain in, in the United States, uh, you know, dating back centuries, which, which is sort of, it's, it, it, there's kind of libertarianism and a notion of freedom and then a notion of individual responsibility. And that made this particular talking point uh, incredibly powerful and pernicious in this culture, because in the same way that in the United States, 
you know, we have more, we have more guns than we do people in this country. And any time a an automatic or semi-automatic weapon is used to to kill a dozen people, the manufacturer nobody ever points their finger at the manufacturer, the, the company that created this weapon and sold it into commerce. There's always a sense of, oh, well, there was some irresponsible person who was using this killing machine to kill people. Um, and there's something about the culture that that lets the person who who made and marketed the weapon off the hook. And it's the same thing with drugs. And so I think there was this sense that, um, like, if you can't handle your Valium, then you shouldn't be taking Valium. But that's not a problem of Valium. There are other people who responsibly use the drug, and they're the ones who we should defer to. Um, and so that was very much the the talking point that, that Arthur and others uh, put forward. Patrick, there's already some great questions coming in and we'll take questions at the end, but there's one from Sydney K that I actually just want to read because I think it's going to, this is the central question that we're going to answer over the course of this discussion. And that is, why do you believe the Sacklers were more, more responsible for the overprescription of the drug, which was effective for chronic pain sufferers rather than doctors or the regulators? Just keep that question in mind as we go through um, a bit more of the detail of the book, because I feel that is very much the, the question. So it, it's in the first chapter of the establishment of Purdue, the pharmaceutical company, that we first see the really rather shocking complicity of industry regulators, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, the FDA, in the form of Henry Welch. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I should say, just, just broadly speaking, in answer to the question, the... Um... The opioid crisis is a tremendously complicated uh, public health crisis that unfolds over a quarter of a century and kills more than half a million people. Um, you don't get there through the bad actions of any one uh, actor or set of actors. Uh, you know, it, it takes a village. Um, I, I think that the, to me, this is a story about kind of total system failure. Uh, and so I, I do think that the Sacklers and Purdue um, share a, a, uh, a kind of a, a, a special part of the blame because of their, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this, but because of the sort of early moves that they took. And, you know, as to the question of the doctors, there were certainly many irresponsible doctors, but they also systematically deceived doctors across the country um, uh, in a very, very deliberate way, which, which subsequently the, com the company pled guilty to federal criminal charges of having done so. So there's no ambiguity on this question that doctors were deceived by the company, uh, which I think mitigates at least somewhat the responsibility of some of these physicians. Um, there's also the question of regulators. And uh, Henry Welch was a, uh, an official at the FDA in Washington if you have a new drug that you want to sell in the United States, you need FDA approval in order to do it. And so uh, the company had to satisfy Henry Welch that the drug was safe, that it was efficacious, and also get him to sign off on the kinds of marketing claims that they were going to be able to make. And you would think that this would be difficult to do. OxyContin was, it was a, a very, very powerful opioid painkiller uh, in very, very large doses. Uh, that were approved, much, much larger doses than had been available and that sort of thing up to that point. Um, but it sailed through the FDA. And Welch not only signed off on the drug um, being safe and effective, but also on a series of marketing claims, which turned out in retrospect to be bogus. Um, the suggestion that there was less abuse liability with the drug, it was less likely to be abused because it had this coding system, which released the drug slowly into your bloodstream. Um, he signed off on that. And nobody knows how that language got in there. Uh, it was subsequently taken out. It's not true. Um, and shortly after approving the drug, Henry Welch leaves the FDA. And a year later, he goes to work for Purdue Pharma for three times his government salary. So this to me feels like corruption. I, I haven't found anyone. I reached Henry Welch on the phone at, uh, I'm, I'm talking about Welch. I'm sorry, Curtis Wright. Curtis Wright. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I reached Curtis Wright on the on the phone. This is the name of the the guy. I was I was mixing him up with another dodgy FDA official. Yeah. Um, uh, and even he didn't really have a he didn't really have a defense that he could give me for this arrangement. Um, so I think that uh, 
there is a, a, a long history, I'm afraid, going back to Henry Welch, the other, yeah. the other FDA examiner. And this is a guy back in the 1950s who takes bribes from Pfizer of the, the regulatory apparatus uh, that is supposed to protect consumers being co-opted either in a kind of explicit kind of bribery form, which is what you get with Henry Welch, or in something that's not, it's, you know, it's a little harder to put your finger on, right? It's not a suitcase full of money, but I think most of us would say it, make, it probably makes you a little bit uncomfortable to think that a regulator could sign off on a drug and a year later go and work for the company that made the drug at a, at a multiple of what the regulator was being paid in government. Right. You know, we're very used to this kind of shenanigans in South Africa as we're emerging from years and years of terrible corruption. And one of the, the, the lines you write in your book, which really stuck with me because it's got so much relevance to our local context, is that the opioid crisis is, among other things, a parable about the awesome capability of private industry to subvert public institutions. I think that's exactly right. And that's what makes it so frightening. Purdue had a problem uh, Patrick, and that was that they had to create the perception that this drug was not addictive. How did they do that? Patrick, are you with us? Uh, I am. You froze up for a moment there, but I, I'm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. I was asking you what Purdue did to overcome the well to create the perception that OxyContin was not addictive. So uh, opioids, which is to say drugs that are derived from the opium poppy, um, you know, humans have known for thousands of years that these drugs have really significant therapeutic properties and can make pain go away, which is kind of a miracle when you think about it. But twinned with that has been an understanding, again, going back uh, to the, the you know, uh, the very earliest days of human history that there are um, that there are downsides and that these these drugs can be habit forming, can be addictive, can be quite dangerous. And what happened with OxyContin was that you had this powerful opioid and you had a climate in which a lot of physicians tended to reserve these drugs for really severe cases for cancer pain for end of life care out of a fear that if you prescribe them too widely uh, and too casually, that uh, the, 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 the risks of addiction might offset the therapeutic upside mm -hmm. of the pain relief. And what Purdue did with OxyContin, which was really novel, was that they were looking to position this drug, not just for really acute, extreme pain, cancer pain, um, the kind of small subset of cases that you graduate to when other remedies uh, have failed or, or are insufficiently powerful. What they wanted to do was have a drug that, that tens of millions of people could use for non-malignant pain, for chronic pain, for all kinds of pain, uh, including pain that you know, might be quite minor, might be better remedied with, with other solutions. They described OxyContin as the drug to start with and to stay with. The idea being, you know, it should be the first course of treatment and you can stay on it indefinitely, which if you're selling pills is a really compelling recipe. Um, but in order to make that happen, they needed to effectively change the mind of the medical establishment about the dangers of these drugs. And, right. and th this is kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier about the special role that Purdue and OxyContin played. And so they, they start this marketing blitz. And this was right out of Arthur Sackler's playbook. They had hundreds of sales reps who they very aggressively incentivized to go out and in the words of one of their uh, official company official, you know, sell, sell, sell OxyContin, get out there, pitch doctors, feed them literature, which turned out a lot of it to be fairly bogus, uh, claim that, um, that the drug is not addictive. Just sort of say blithely, it's not addictive. It's addictive less than 1% of the time. If you have pain and you take the drug as administered by a doctor, don't worry, it's not addictive. And so I've interviewed many of these sales reps. They would repeat this just like a mantra all day, meeting with thousands of doctors all across the country. The company set up junkets, thousands of these pain management clinics and, and seminars that they would have in 
in resorts and they would, you know, kind of all expenses paid weekends. They set up a speakers bureau in which they paid some doctors to go out and speak to other doctors. Again, the Arthur Sackler idea that you want to persuade the physician and, and they would actually enlist other doctors to kind of make their sales pitch for them. Um, and so it was just a total juggernaut uh, in terms of all of the different means used. There's a statistic in the book. You know, if you talk to physicians a lot of the time, there may be doctors tuning in right now. Um, certainly physicians who I know will occasionally say to me, oh, you know, I know that big pharma does all this stuff, but I wouldn't be influenced by it. You couldn't influence the way I write prescriptions. And it turns out that, you know, that they do this stuff because it works. So Purdue Pharma some years was spending $9 million just to buy food for doctors. And, and you know, some doctors might say, oh, you could never change the way I prescribe by buying me a steak dinner. But of course they could and they did. And, they, and the company watched that money closely and knew the return on investment they were getting on every dollar spent buying food for doctors. So it turns out doctors can be, I think, more readily influenced than sometimes we might like to think. And just to add, Patrick, when it comes to the, the sales force, you point out in the book that techniques were employed, which are literally those of drug cartels, including giving free samples and targeting areas known to be places with lots of, you know, industrial accidents, injuries and that sort of thing, which stunningly enough is, as you say, it's exactly what heroin, heroin peddlers do. Yeah, I mean, for me, this given that I had this background writing about the illicit drug trade, it was really um, quite stunning for me to realize that some of the techniques that you see the Sinaloa cartel uh, put it, you know, I studied the way that cartel used Chicago um, as a hub for its products. And there were a bunch of things that the Sinaloa cartel did that it turns out Purdue Pharma Salesforce did as well. It's, it's quite something. So the late 1990s, um, the first reports start coming in of oxydes. It's a, around that time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's right. Because, and many people who are prescribed the drug for legitimate pain conditions and to take it as the doctor ordered, and you taught me a new word here, iatrogenic, is that, mm -hmm. is that the right term? Mm -hmm. Right. Find that they've become hopelessly addicted. And partly, right, that's because one of the claims made was that it would work for 12 hours, and it doesn't really for many people. It only works for eight hours, and the company knows this. So talk about the growing awareness that there's an issue with addiction versus what the company is actually doing to try and conceal that. Yeah, I mean, I, this was for me going, going into this project. I started, I wrote initially a, a big piece about the Sackler family in 2017 for The New Yorker. And and the and the project proceeded in phases from there. And one of my big questions at the outset was, as it always is in these types of situations, is what did they know and when did they know it? And um, there was a very clear um, timeline that the company and the family put forward to suggest that they they start selling OxyContin in early 1996 and that they didn't learn of any real significant problems until early 2000. So, so in their timeline, there's like a four year honeymoon period where the drug is easing terrible pain, it's become a huge blockbuster, and they have no real inkling at all that there's any significant problems associated mm -hmm. with OxyContin. And I was always as little suspicious of this, and, and part of the reason is because of the way they explained how they figured it out. So their story was always that it was only in early 2000 that they read from press reports about problems of widespread abuse of OxyContin. And that seemed weird to me as a journalist who's written about companies in the past, because I think even if you're quite a good investigative reporter writing about bad things that happen at a company, usually the company knows before you do. You know, if, if, if you're like on the outside writing about a problem with a, with a product, for instance, some consumer safety issue, generally speaking, the, the company is going to have some sense of what's going on before you alert them to it or you alert the world to it. So I, there was just something, I got a whiff of something about that, that story that, that seemed a little suspicious. And sure enough, as I dug into the research and was able to obtain a lot of internal documentation from the company. 
it turns out that this was a lie. It wasn't true that you had four years when they didn't know. In fact, the problems start almost immediately. I mean, by 1997, so within a year of the drug being released. And the company knows at the highest levels. And, and if you think about what I mentioned with the sales reps, this makes sense because the way in which these companies operate and Purdue in particular operated is they had, I think about 700 sales representatives all across the country, each with their own region. And every day they, they, they're in the car and they're going out meeting with doctors and pharmacists and nurses. So this is a, you know, this is kind of a canary in the coal mine, right? Like this is a, an early warning system um, you have these eyes and ears all across the country and word filters back because those reps are writing up their reports. And so word comes back that there are problems. And basically what happened is this is covered up. There's no effort to publicly address this. Instead, they lie about the timeline. Um, and it's really only in 2000 when the problems were so widespread that the company could no longer keep their head in the sand. That sort of willful blindness was no longer sustainable that they acknowledge that there's a problem. And when they do, they invoke the, the same line that Arthur and others use about Valium and say, it's not the drug that's the problem, it's the patients. Patrick, let's just talk a bit about the role of doctors because I'm seeing some, I mean, perhaps there are doctors in the audience who are feeling a little defensive here. It seemed to me that there were a number of issues going on here. One is that some patients were genuinely very naive about opioids at that time. Another is that Purdue had lied about certain aspects. For instance, they said the drugs were addiction proof because of the slow release measures. So it wouldn't pr pr produce the highs and lows. But a third is that they were legitimately dodgy physicians, obviously running what you call what they call rather pill mills. Mm -hmm. um, does that about cover it? Yeah, I think it's a continuum, and I, I think it's 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 um, and and there's a bunch of gradations in between. So you have, as you say, you have pill mills, you have criminal enterprises in which physicians are um, are deliberately over prescribing. They'll, you know, it's it's essentially a kind of fraudulent operation where somebody comes in, they tell you a few symptoms, you you write them a prescription, and generally those doctors are getting paid to write those prescriptions. So you have those. I should note that. The company was very aware of that happening because the company knew uh, almost in real time, you know, who's prescribing what. That's how they target these doctors. And so if you had some little, you know, some some little osteopath practice in a small rural area that is suddenly just fire hosing Oxycontin prescriptions, the company knew and the company would have known that that doesn't make any sense. Um but so that's on the kind of criminal end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, you have, or I should say, in, in the middle, you've got um, kind of pain crusaders. You have physicians who felt, I think rightly, uh, that pain had been undertreated, yeah. that, that doctors were not taking it seriously enough, that many people were forced to live with terrible chronic pain, and that a, that a, um, a kind of puritanical... Uh, hesitation to prescribe opioids was part of what contributed to the problem. So you had a lot of people who believed um, that opioids should be more widely prescribed. Um, a lot of those people happened to have their research funded by Purdue and other companies and happened to become paid speakers. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it was an explicit quid pro quo where they were saying things they didn't believe because they were given money. I think it was more of a symmetry of interests. But there is, a, I, I thought, a sort of somewhat unholy um, symmetry of interest between the people who genuinely believed that opioids should be more widely prescribed and the industry boosters who back them. Then you keep going out on the continuum. And at the other end, you have physicians. I've, inter I've interviewed many of these physicians who they're very busy. They see a lot of patients. They tended not to be pain specialists. A lot of the time they had not taken any kind of specialized uh, um, course of study in, in pain. But pain is one of the symptoms that their patients come to them with. And they got into this business because they want to relieve pain. They want to help people. And so I think there are many people who in good faith were told, here is a solution. This can bring relief to your patients. It has virtually no side effects. There are no risks here. The education that they got in pain medicine came from the industry and the industry, I think, lied about this. And so I think there were many doctors who were, um, wh whose sincere desire to care for patients uh, was in some ways exploited by 
a fairly uh, rapacious set of corporate interests. Yeah, speaking of rapacious, one stat in your book that absolutely blew my mind was the case of an individual doctor who had a patient on OxyContin for two years with a prescription for 24 80 milligram pills each day. And you know, the, another astonishing thing is that initially, and I didn't know this, OxyContin had a 160 milligram pill, which they openly acknowledge could kill a child, for instance, if a child were to ingest it. I mean, that's, that's something. Patrick, um, it struck me that there are many industries who come out of this looking bad, not just the pharmaceutical industry, not just the medical industry. There's McKinsey, for instance, who openly advises the Sacklers on how to grow the market for Oxy. And maybe you can talk about that. And then there's also journalism. You know, there's the case of um, the New York Times. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the um, again, to go back to what I was saying about how it takes a village and it's a story mm. of systemic failure. I, I, to me, there is a there are a bunch of public institutions which failed and continued to fail over the course of decades and were co-opted in ways large and small by money. Uh, I also I think what was personally very dispiriting to me was um, that there has always been a kind of cadre of enablers. I'm a lawyer by training. I went to law school. I never practiced, um, but my wife is a lawyer and many people in my world are lawyers. Um, and I have to say, I was shocked getting into this story by the role that consultants like McKinsey play, mm -hmm. the role, the role that that attorneys play. Um, many of them, kind of big name attorneys with political connections, people who, if you're a lawyer, you might have grown up revering, um, uh, often end up being uh, both the sword and the shield for a family like the Sacklers. Um, and so you see this, you know, with McKinsey coming in, in the face of a terrible opioid crisis and trying to figure out ways to advise, uh, Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers on how can they, uh, how can they target the doctors who prescribe the most to prescribe greater doses of the drug for a longer period of time. And this is in a stage when it was pretty widely agreed that that was sort of a recipe for trouble, that that the, actually the, what they should be doing from a therapeutic point of view was the opposite, was that yes, OxyContin can have great therapeutic benefits, but you should be prescribing it in as small a dose as possible for as short a period of time, not as big a dose as possible for as long a period of time. And it, it gets to the point with McKinsey where eventually their, their level of culpability is such that I was so amazed by this. At a certain point when these lawsuits start coming up around, the, 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 around Purdue, having to do with the opioid crisis. One of the McKinsey partners writes to the other, I think it might be time for us to start destroying our documents. And the other one sort of says, yeah, great. They put it in an email, like let's, let's start eliminating the paper trail, um, which is not a great look, I don't think, um, uh, in terms of the corporate ethics of this. As for the New York Times, the, in 2001, a New York Times investigative reporter named Barry Meyer uh, gave this story a kind of national attention and prominence it hadn't had up to that point. And he revealed that there's this new drug. It's meant for pain, but it's killing people. People are getting addicted to it. And he focused on Purdue. He, meant, he mentioned the Sackler family. And the, Purdue really wanted to shut him down because he was a great reporter. And he was, he was really, he was like a dog with a bone. He was coming after them. And Barry Meyer published a book in 2003 called Painkiller. And after that book came out, the company's lawyers went to the New York Times, went over Barry Meyer's head. And amazingly, the argument they made was a conflict of interest argument. They said, because this reporter has written a book on this subject, any future articles he might write are just promotion for his book. And the New York Times, in a, I think a, a great lapse in judgment, uh, was persuaded by these lawyers to take their guy on the OxyContin story off the story. And there, there wasn't some great team of other people. I mean, he was the person. And they took him off the story at the request of Purdue Pharma. I mean, that is just astonishing. But as you say, it, come, it came at a, at, a, at a weak time for the new, they were vulnerable. They'd been through the plagiarism scandal. Perhaps that partially explains it. Um, 
Patrick, before we get to these many great questions coming in, let's just try to start tying it all together. So first of all, one of the questions I think a lot of people want to know is what evidence is there that the Sackler family were intimately involved in all of this? So the, uh, it's a great question, and, and the Sacklers have said in their own defense, I should make clear, um, the, the family did not cooperate with this book. They've been threatening to sue me for the last two years. Um, they were very, very hostile to the notion of, of this book coming out. So um, you should understand that when I say this, I wrote this, uh, you know, I wrote it from the outside. Having said that, I wrote it with, you know, I interviewed 200 people and and uh, had the access to tens of thousands of pages of documents, many of them internal documents, indeed, including private emails from the Sacklers themselves. And so the story that the family tells publicly is that they were never very involved at all. You know, some of them sat on the board, but it was a very arm's length thing. And there's a little bit of, um, you know, I'm shocked, shocked to learn that there's gambling in this casino. Uh, they're, they're, the company has now pled guilty to criminal charges twice in 2007 mm -hmm. and again in 2020. And the family sort of says, you know, oh, it's so upsetting for us to learn that our company has done this, these bad things. Um, so when you look into it, when you look into the emails, they were running the company. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a time, Richard Sackler was, was literally the chief executive of the company. He was a second generation Sackler, very, very intimately involved with OxyContin. Uh, and um, some of his, his, uh, you know, his siblings and some of his cousins had, had roles in the company itself. But then throughout, and even after he stepped down, they were on the board of directors. And there are multiple emails from CEOs, different CEOs of the company saying, saying in almost verbatim saying, I am trying to be the CEO of this company and run the company. You are making it impossible because as a board, you are effectively operating as the CEO. You're not letting me do my job. You're micromanaging, you're coming in. Um, and so this, this, uh, this defense that the Sacklers have, have raised, um, you know, I think legally it may end up being a, a useful defense for them, but in terms of anybody with eyes in their head looking at the facts, when you look at the emails, and I, I think the book is is fairly well documented, uh, you'll see that this was a, a family and with with uh, you know very very granular knowledge of what was happening at the company um, and a very decisive point of view and a tendency not just to manage but to micromanage uh, every small detail. They all just sound like the most appalling bosses. I mean, the comparison which has been raised over and over is with the TV series Succession. Immediately, it comes to mind, this kind of overbearing patriarch and these kind of hapless kids. There's also a great quote in your book where you say that in any dynasty with lots of money, um, the generations tend to get less and less impressive as you go further from the source of the money, yeah. which is sadly very true. One of the things I wanted to ask you about as well is you, you say that there's a notable absence of whistleblowers in the OxyContin story, which is so fascinating. To what do you attribute that? I th it's a bit of a mystery. I, I think that the, I, I'm very interested in, um, uh, in the kind of collective, um, in collective denial. I'm interested in the stories people tell themselves about the decisions that they make. And, this is a story about a family which I think has done some terrible things, but never really woke up to it and instead has assumed a kind of bunker mentality in which they feel as though they've just been terribly misunderstood. Mm -hmm. It's also a story about a family company that, you know, is a privately held company, very much sort of created in the image of this very eccentric family that runs it. Many, many people at the company felt great loyalty to the Sacklers. Some of them still do today. And so I, I think it's, it's uh, um, to me, there is a kind of willful blindness, a kind of collective delusion in which people really bought that idea of, oh, it's the abusers. Richard Sackler once described the people who abused his drug and got addicted and died from it as the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that was a kind of pervasive attitude inside the company. Um, I think there were a lot of fairly mercenary people, and I, here I would include the lawyers as well, mm. who, uh, you know, they wanted to buy a summer house in the Hamptons, and they thought if they just stuck around and held their nose, um, maybe they'd be able to. And so I feel as though, 
there are this it's a story about kind of small incremental moral compromises which which end up coalescing into this uh, really, really terrible crisis. And at a certain point when you're looking back at a crisis in which half a million people have died, I think on some level, any of us would really struggle. I think what I say at the end of the book is that you, you don't wanna open the door a crack because if you actually open up the door, if you start to have those doubts, to entertain those doubts, um, I think it could, it could overwhelm anybody. Yeah. Last question from me before we hit the questions, and that is, I don't know if you have this data to hand, but can you, as concisely as possible, make the case for us that it is specifically OxyContin that we can link to the rise of the opioid crisis in the States, as you do in your book, I think, very successfully? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard to, it's a, too, I mean, we would need more time than we have. I walk through this in, in great, a great length uh, in the book. I, I think that if you look at the patterns of opioid prescribing, um, they change really dramatically right around the introduction of OxyContin specifically. Uh, if you look at all of the other big pharma companies that put out opioids, they all pretty explicitly were looking to copy what Purdue did. There was a sense that Purdue led and they followed. The Purdue created the market in the words of one of these companies. There's a study that I cite at the end of the book about how through a kind of a, a an almost a regulatory accident, there were five states in the United States where the company did less of a marketing push mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1990s. And these are states that are in different places. They have different sizes, different economies, nothing else in common. What they have in common is that Purdue did less of a marketing push for OxyContin back in the 1990s. And this is what's really crazy. If you follow these states through, it's not just a situation in which there was less OxyContin abuse. Uh, but in fact, once the opioid crisis transitions to heroin and indeed to fentanyl, there are fewer overdoses and less abuse in these states even now. And what, the, what this study, which is a very rigorous study, attributes this to is it can all be attributed to the fact that there was less of a marketing push in these five states way back in 1996. That has sheltered them uh, in terms of fentanyl deaths today. So I think it's a very, very complicated situation. I don't mean to suggest for a moment um, that Purdue is the only bad actor here, but I do think that there was a special role as a first mover. Sydney Kay, I hope that has convinced you in your question about whether you think the cyclists are being unfairly scapegoated. Um, I should mention Patrick also has a fantastic podcast, Wind of Change, and CS, he or she says they're a huge fan. They want to know, what do you think of the fallout from this scandal? So perhaps you could briefly take us through the legal um, consequences and also whether you think justice in any meaningful way has yet been achieved. Uh, well, to, to take the second part first, no, I don't think justice has been achieved. I don't think this is a, a, a sadly a story in which it will be achieved. Um, very, very briefly, uh, it, Purdue, you know, having pled guilty to criminal charges in 2007 and said, oh, we've cleaned up our act. We'll never do anything like that again. They went right back into business uh, committing crimes and, in fact, pled guilty again in 2020, just a few months ago, to a new set of federal crimes. And actually, at that point, they were pleading guilty to conduct stretching back 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, in between these two guilty pleas, the Sacklers start quietly taking money out of the company and draining the coffers of the company. They take, we, we know for certain that they took uh, more than $10 billion out over the course of about a decade. And when the coffers are nearly empty, you have thousands of lawsuits. At this point, every state in the United States is suing Purdue. Half the states are suing individual members of the Sackler family. But what happens is that when the company's taken, when the family's taken all the money out, they say, oh, the company has no money left and they kick it into bankruptcy. And so now you have this kind of crazy thing where it's the denouement is going to happen in a bankruptcy court. Hmm. Uh, the company no longer has the money to, to contend with all of these lawsuits. Hmm. All the creditors are going to have to take pennies on the dollar if they're lucky to get that. And then sitting, sitting on the sidelines are the Sacklers who've taken $10 billion out and have not declared bankruptcy. And the way it's going to end is they have proposed that they pay uh, a sum of money, they're, they're suggesting four and a quarter billion dollars, that they keep the rest, so they, they have about an $11 billion fortune, um, that they make no admission of wrongdoing, and then they want the bankruptcy judge to give them essentially immunity from any future lawsuits. And he seems inclined to do it, even though they haven't declared bankruptcy in his court, he has the power to bestow this 
immunity immunity upon them. So to me, this is uh, to me this isn't justice. I think that mm. any, anybody looking closely at the situation who who's not employed by the Sacklers uh, probably wouldn't describe it as justice. Um, but I think, unfortunately, this is the way our system is is fashioned. And if you have a lot of money, uh, you are insulated um, both you know, systemically and then also just in terms of the, the kind of legal counsel you can hire and the money you can spend from the downstream consequences of your own decision. So I, I'm, I'm afraid to say, and you know, I think the, the, the one bit of cold comfort is that the Sackler name right. is, is no longer venerated. The, the name has come down from a bunch of prominent institutions. I think it will come down from more. Um, I think the truth is out there in a way that the family is uncomfortable with. But I think fundamentally, this is a story in which the bad guys get away with it in the end. Although to some degree, as you say, becoming social pariahs might be pushing it, but to some degree. Tanya Faber wants to know, can you talk about the role of pharmacies? Because they also stood to gain income, with, obviously had a conflict of interest here. What do we know about that? Uh, so the pharmacies absolutely are, I mean, there's a range of different types of pharmacies. There are, um, you know, there are criminal pharmacies. There were pharmacies that were like the pill mills, uh, really in on it and knew what was going on. There are pharmacies that were acting with a kind, what I would think of as a sort of a criminal negligence in the sense that they should have known. Um, and I think they probably had their heads in the sand because you look at the sheer volume uh, that some doctors are prescribing. Um, and then there were pharmacies that, that tried to blow the whistle, um, that tried to, you know, that, that, that contacted the authorities, that contacted Purdue, um, where people tried to do the right thing. There is a whole, it's, it's one of the biggest, um, most complex uh, civil litigation situations in U.S. history unfolding right now, this multi-district litigation in which you have, uh, you know, Purdue as a defendant, but also, you know, Johnson & Johnson and a whole series of other, Teva, all, all, the, all the big big pharma companies that, that sold opioids. You have the distributors, uh, which actually, you know, distributed the drugs to the pharmacies. And you have the big pharmacy chains like CVS and Walmart are also uh, defendants in these cases. So I think absolutely the, the, uh, the pharmacies have um, a great deal to answer for as well. But again, as with the physicians, I think there's a, there's a real range from the kind mm. of outright criminal to the, um, to the, the, the just naive, to the willfully naive, to the, um, you know, the trying to, trying to do the right thing um, and mm. everything in between. So many great questions here. Here's a really goodie, Patrick and I, you and I were discussing this a little bit off screen. Has the opioid, opioid crisis, in your view, fueled some of the anti-vax sentiment in terms of it spurring on a kind of cynicism about the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry? It, it, it's a great question. And I, I'll tell you, I worried that it would. Um, there's a huge amount of anti-vax sentiment, uh, certainly in the United States, um, and, uh, vaccine hesitancy, um, you know, people not wanting to get, to get these new vaccines. It was, I was saying, I was saying earlier that it was a, a strange for me to publish a book, um, in which, you know, early on in the book, uh, that guy, Henry Welch, who was an FDA official, takes a bribe from Pfizer. And I published the book about a week after getting my first shot of the Pfizer vaccine and, and yeah. before getting the second one. Um, I don't think of these as actually linked, strangely enough. I mean, I have not, I'm out there having these conversations every day. And, and while there is a great deal of vaccine, uh, hesitancy and, 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 um, there's a kind of an anti-vax movement in some corners of the United States, I don't see people citing, mm -hmm. uh, the opioid crisis in particular. I think that there are, you know, th th there's a kind of particular anthropological history, to that kind of sentiment uh, that that doesn't even need to get to the opioid crisis in order to find justifications. And I should say that's a relief to me because while I believe that um, there are very good grounds to be very skeptical about the motivations of big pharma, mm. I wouldn't I wouldn't want that skepticism to um, to translate into a kind of a refusal to accept that uh, that these are miraculous vaccines that were produced in record time. And uh, really the only way we're going to get through this is if people take them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question, Teresa. From Moira Young, what are the chances that this modus operandi is a norm in the pharmaceutical industry? And just to connect that with another one, who was this from? I can't remember, but has there been any signs of regulatory changes? Is it, has anything been put in place, in other words, to prevent this happening in future? 
I mean, there have been some steps taken, you know, the, uh, it, it's really hard because in terms of the systemic stuff, take the Curtis Wright thing as an example, the guy at the FDA, I think anybody looking at that situation would say it's pretty inappropriate that he went and got a job at, at, mm -hmm. at Purdue uh, a year later. But at the same time, how do we police that? So what do you say? There should be a cooling off period. Well, how long should it last? Mm -hmm. uh, so a year is too short, but but three years, five years. I mean, you know, are people going to want to go and work at the FDA if they feel mm -hmm. as though they'll be they'll be conflicted out for five years after they leave? I, I don't mean to suggest for a moment that the fixes here are easy. Um, mm -hmm. There has been, I think, a, uh, a pronounced shift in the approach to prescribing. Um, this is, you know, to some degree regulatory and to some degree just about the, the norms of prescribing. Um, in fact, many pain patients worry that, it, that the pendulum has swung too far back the other way, that you have physicians who are worried about liability, uh, who are worried about addiction, and who, as a consequence, are trying to get people off of these drugs. And this is a terrible situation. I mean, I hear from from chronic pain patients who are um, who are physically dependent on these drugs and have been mm -hmm. taking them for years and are worried that they're going to lose access and end up in pain again. And I, I think that what is so sad to me about this is that the industry taught the medical profession how to get people onto these drugs, but never taught them how to get people off. And so we're sort of stuck now. Um, with a, a very large community of people who um, who worry that 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 they will be kind of victimized anew by the shifting attitudes in the profession. Mm -mm. Perhaps we'll take the last question, which is a bit of a personal one from Jenny Pina. Gosh, Patrick, after unearthing all this, are you safe? Are you in any personal danger? Do you think? I think I'm okay. I mean, I, I, I uh, it's nice of you to ask. And there, there was a moment that I talk about at the end of the book where. Mm. Mike, we had a, there was a private investigator who was staking out my house last year. That was as personal and as kind of close as it got. I was honestly more upset about the fact that my children had to see that. And it, I found, I think I have small kids and they were found it unsettling that there was somebody staking out our house. Um, but um, no, I, I listen, the, I think the worst that would happen is they might sue me and that would actually be a, that'd be a terrible move for them. I mean, it'd be great, great publicity for the book and they would lose. The lawsuit um, and a lot of bad publicity for them. So, so I, I feel like they probably they they won't even do that. And um, no, so I, I I don't worry too much about it. Look, I, I think this is a um, you know I mentioned I hear from pain patients. The other people I hear from is people who've lost loved ones to opioids. And every few days I get a note from from a mother or a father who's lost a child. And um, I, you know, what that brings home for me is the urgency of, of the story, but also it, it um, uh, you're not going to find me speaking in any melodramatic terms about w what I've gone through. I haven't gone through a anything really, you know, um, uh, that, that sort of thing puts it in, um, it puts it all in context. Absolutely. Are you able to tell us what you're working on next? Which industry should be afraid? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to figure it out. It's funny. Some, you mentioned the whistleblower thing. I, I, I think I'm going to do a piece for The New Yorker about, about whistleblowing. Who does it? Who doesn't? How do we incentivize people? There are some sort of fraught ethics in play. I haven't figured out exactly what the story is going to be, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of starting to see the outlines of something. Oh, we've had a great national discussion about that, the ethical purity of whistleblowers. It's a mm. whole thing, Patrick. Get Absolutely. involved in South Africa. Thank you yeah. so much to Patrick Radden Keith. His book, to repeat, is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. I cannot recommend it enough. It is a page turner at 400 odd pages. Seriously, it is money back if you don't agree with me. You can buy it by clicking on the link in the chat bar. It'll be delivered free to your home anywhere in South Africa. Patrick, thank you again, and thank you for this oh, wonderful such a pleasure. book. Thank Thanks. you, and thank you all for joining us. Bye. Cheers. Good night, everyone.